we're catching up with Bob Gordio, and it's a great story to tell, Bob. I mean, you've been involved with uh, Jersey Boys as one of the founders, one of the people uh, as part of the story, and then right through until the creation of the story. Uh, and you've seen this story just roll out all around the world. You must be very proud to see yourself. Yeah, I am. I'm very proud of uh, Jersey Boys and, 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 you know, the people that have been involved with it, Des Mackinoff and... Uh, Michael David, uh, Rick Ellis, Marshall Brickman, Sergio uh, Trujillo, I, and we've just had an incredible team from La Jolla, which mm -hmm. is uh, where we premiered. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's Bob Cruz's line in the show, uh, uh, the stars are in alignment, <clears throat> which is, I think, the case with Jersey Boys. It was just one of those times in your life where everything works. Yeah. You know, just what everything worked. Yeah. Well, Jersey Boys is the story of Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons, Bob being one of the founding members of the Four Seasons and the guy who wrote all of the songs. Uh, when you see the story on, on, on stage, I mean, how much poetic license has been taken? Is it, is it as it happened? It, it, there's, there's juxtapositioning going on, who left when, so on, and the music is not in chronological order. Um, there's a couple of surprises, uh, like the opening. <laughs> I remember an older couple in La Jolla looking at each other and saying, are we at the right show? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, that's good. A little shock value doesn't hurt anybody, yeah. right? Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's just been a, a, a wonderful thing from the beginning. So it, it's always... Uh, uh, I'm losing a little track of where we started with this because I think I just repeated myself. But the question was about how you know how close to you know, how close I was. Yeah. To yeah. The story. Well, the story. Both Frankie and I uh, uh, communicated with uh, uh, Marshall and Rick early on. They got on board. Rick Ellis first, and then Marshall, and then we we pretty much spilled our guts, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak, and. Uh, there's, there's, there's the art of writing, you know. Uh, we told our story, and they put it down on, on paper and, and wrote a phenomenal book. There's usually bases for everything in there, and Frankie, I think, concluded after seeing the show 20 or 30 times, it's about 95% accurate. Yeah. Uh, uh, did we say every single word verbatim? No, of course not. So uh, did they take a few liberties here and there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, this we probably weren't as funny as they made us out to be. <laughs> uh, and we certainly don't dance as well as these kids do. Yeah. And uh, maybe didn't sing as well. But, uh, yeah, it's very, very, very authentic to the point of sometimes being a bit frightening. Yeah, I guess from a plot, it's got all the right ingredients. It's got the star, it's got the songs, it's got the villain. Yeah, yeah, it's got a couple of villains. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I guess. I guess if you were to observe it from that standpoint, it's. It's pretty much got it all. You know, uh, you can have it all and still not work. Um, this just happens to be one of those situations where it works. Yeah, and uh, you know, somebody who was involved with you becoming a member of the band was Joe Pesci, who yes. went on to become a famous actor after the, afterwards. What was Joe at, at that point? Well, as he's portrayed in, in the show, he, he was kind of someone that uh, was just around. You know, he's a friend. I played in a band, my first, second band after the Royal Teens, uh, when I left, it was a jazz quartet. Mm -hmm. And Joe played guitar and sang, kind of the front man, and uh, does a great porky pig. <laughs> Uh, he's just a funny guy. It's funny because when I saw him in the, uh, uh, the Raging Bull, I thought, my God, you know, he's a hell of an actor. Mm. And he went on to win an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. But I, I, I said to Judy at the time, Joey's a funny guy. If, if he ever makes a funny movie, he's gonna be, it's going to be a killer for him. And then, sure enough, he came along and he made Home Alone and mm -hmm. he made, uh, I forgot the one in between where he played some cameo, you know, uh, smaller roles, but he, he stole this, the scene because mm. he's such a funny, funny guy. And he's yeah. an excellent guitar player. He's an excellent singer. Mm. So uh, um, he, he uh, but, but he was... Uh, there as he is in in the show and hung out with Tommy 
Uh, and now, uh, well, I don't want to give too much of this away yeah. for people who, who haven't seen it. There, there should be a certain amount of surprise here. Yeah. But yeah, he was he was one of the, one of the guys. Mm. Well, cool. Tommy was the villain as portrayed in the show. Yeah. But you know, how integral was he to the success of the Four Seasons? Uh, you know, I think I think you can't pull pieces out. Uh, I think everything was there, and, and it played a role. I don't know if this could have happened if Tommy wasn't there in the beginning. It all it all evolved uh, and took its proper course. Uh, um, when I came in the group, things changed, uh, and then later on, music changed and we changed. And can't take my eyes off you. The solo situation. So I, I have to say that you know, given Tommy his due. Uh, he was there, as he said in the show. You know, this wouldn't have happened uh, if, if I wasn't. No, that's my line. <laughs> uh, of course, that one's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very important. I think it's very important. Nikki's role was very important. Mm. Uh, we carried on after both were gone. But, you know, similar to the Michael Jackson situation, Michael had his Quincy time, and then he went off and did his own thing. And uh, brilliant music also. Mm. Uh, I'll, I'll take you back to 15-year-old Bob Gordio and a song called Short Shorts. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the first song that you had right. success with, I guess, right. 15 years old, and you've got this massive hit around the world. Mm. Yeah. What effect did that have on you? Well, I left high school. <laughs> <laughs> got me out of studying. Yeah. Um, it, it was pretty, uh, uh, pretty amazing for me. I was, was 15 or 16 by that time. I did uh, leave high school to go on the road with, as it states in the show, with Jackie Wilson and, and Buddy Holly and the Everly Brothers and Clyde McFadder and Sam Cooke. Uh, and and uh, it, it, was a, it was a tumultuous time in the U.S. because it was this segregation and with lots of uh, uh, rioting going on and we were playing down the south. So four kids from the northern part of New Jersey experiencing that crossing the Mason Dixon line and and what went on and, and black and white rest stops with us in the bus was was a real eye opener at a very early age you know I grew up very very quickly uh, coincidentally I just got my high school diploma I was about to ask you about that because uh, congratulations <laughs> yeah, that was about six or seven months ago it was great it was it, they, they were wonderful at, in Bergenfield High School and uh, they actually did the full tilt commencement and yeah. the cap and the gown and um, everybody was there except I was I was the only one <laughs> receiving you know, my diploma. But it, it, it was uh, something I missed and it, and it was wonderful. My kids were there. It was a great, great day. Yeah. Let's get into the, uh, the Four Seasons. The first song uh, that you wrote that was the hit, Sherry. Uh, right. That you wrote in 15 minutes, I believe. Yeah, that's true. I know. I, I've said this before. It sounds like a B-movie script. <laughs> but... Uh, I was just at my parents' house and uh, had 15 to 20 minutes before I had to leave to go to Newark for rehearsal at Frankie's, and it just popped into my head. And I wrote a quick lyric because I didn't have a tape recorder, and I didn't think I'd remember the melody without a lyric, and I'm singing it all the way down in the car and got to rehearsal, and off it went. You know, uh, Tommy and Nikki weren't enthralled with it. Frankie thought it was great. And uh, we got into a little voting thing, and it was a tie, two and two. And I think I said, or someone said, uh, well, let's call crew and we'll rehearse it a bit first and let him hear it and see what he thinks. And it's just like it happens in the show, you know. It was, uh, except, uh, I don't know how much... What, what's the language barrier here, you know? <laughs> I mean, what, you can how say far whatever can we you go? like. Well, we, we sang it for crew on the phone, and... Uh, uh, the response I got when I spoke to him was, if I don't fuck it up, that's a number one record. <laughs> it's not the way it is in the show, but, but yeah. it's not like we're at a loss for four-letter words. Yeah, but I, I guess, you know, back then, what was it, 62, 63? You know, yeah, it was like 47 61. years ago. Yeah. You could not possibly imagine that 15 minutes after you started to write that thing when it was completed, that here we are 10 years into the 20th, 21st century and you'd still be talking about it. No, I know. I it's it's quite mind mind boggling. Uh, it's one thing, you know. We've had a lot of offers before this happened to uh, to do movie of the week and things of that sort. But uh, we just sort of held out for. Uh, let's see if we can turn this into something more than just a, a you know quick burn. 
and and to actually have it happen and get it it's one thing to get it on the stage you know and have somebody care enough to produce it and direct it as as des uh, has done uh, but it's another thing to have it be this successful mm. it's funny at halftime uh, I, I we weren't there doing previews and frankie nor i but a good friend of mine was there larry brown and uh, he uh called me at intermission and he said my god he said if if it he said this is going to be bigger than you guys ever were <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'm, well, that nothing would thrill me more. Yeah, and yeah. and so so it is. Well, you know, I mean, you you just look at the soundtrack of you know all of these songs that you created yourself. Uh, uh, Big girls don't cry. Walk like a man. Uh, Dawn, go yeah. away. Ragdoll. Did they all come like in fifteen minutes? No. <laughs> was some, some of them were torture. In, yeah. uh, Ragdoll in particular uh, was inspired by I think it's Tenth or Eleventh Avenue in New York. They have what I consider the world's longest light. It lasted probably three minutes or so. So if you got st you stuck there, which I did one morning going to the studio, you'd have to wait it out. And I uh, happened to be first in line. And traditionally there were, you know, uh, the have-nots who would be standing on the corners and they'd clean your windows and try and get a quarter or something and, you know, uh, trying to survive. And this one morning I, uh, I saw this tiny little hand you know, barely reach the window and start cleaning it. And I looked down and there was the rag doll. I mean, she couldn't have been more than eight years old, mm. and dirty face and tattered clothes. And it, it just stayed with me. I reached in my pocket to give her some change and I had like a $10 bill. And I thought for a second, uh, <laughs> but I said, how can I possibly not give her something? You know, so I gave her the $10 bill and I, the horns were beeping now because I, I was mesmerized by this face and the horns were beeping and I started to pull away but I could see in the rear view mirror she stood in the middle of the street with the $10 bill just stunned mm. you know and finally she moved out of the way and that stayed with me and that was ragdoll but that was the initial inspiration but it took like three weeks to finish the last line of the song really? I mean it was a and now that I look at it and say why was that so difficult? <laughs> but you know, it, it's just the process. You know, sometimes it works easy; it's quick, and sometimes um, it's grueling. Yeah. What about big, big girls don't cry? Hard or easy? That that was a easier than Ragdoll, mm -hmm. but but still, you know, I'm probably because um, the pressure of having Sherry. Uh, which was uh, a huge record, six or seven weeks at number one. And having to follow it up, we, we started to get the sweats. <laughs> so it, it, we, we, we labored on that one for a while, too. So yeah. I, I think primarily pressure was, was uh, the reason. Mm. And then, like, the Four Seasons sort of stopped being... Frankie was doing the solo thing. Can't yeah. take my eyes off of you. Was right. your song as well, but a solo hit for Frankie. Mm -hmm. Well, Frankie, uh, and we knew no one really had a clue at, at, at what his versatility was, you know. So that was a big plus. Uh, but I, both Bob and I, knew that he he just couldn't spend the rest of his career singing falsetto uh, on top of harmony parts. So uh, we knew he did want to do a solo. He, he and his love was always a little bit to the jazz side uh, of things. And one of my great loves was uh, Stan Kenton Band. So um, hence the horn solo in the middle and the sound of it. So we, uh, we plotted mm. <laughs> to do a solo with Frankie. And it was a difficult thing because... And we thought we had a great record, but the record company, for lots of reasons, and I suspect now thinking about it, primarily because they were afraid if he did have a hit as a single, it would be the end of the four seasons. Mm. So they weren't a, really up for this. Uh, and they thought that it was just not a pop record at the time. And, and probably not, because it was a little too romantic, a little too middle of the road, but yet it had this heavy drum rhythm track. So we kind of were in the middle of nowhere. So it was a very difficult uh, time to try and get it accomplished.
but no matter how much we assure the record company, Frankie's not leaving the group. This is just another side of Frankie. This is, you know, he should be allowed to stretch out because he can. And we can write something beyond what we've been writing. But it was a battle. It was, it was a battle from the beginning. Mm. But if anything, I mean, you were the one that had the work outside the group. Uh, Silence is Golden came along. The tremolos hit. Yep. Yeah, well, we had we had successes. Sun Ain't Gonna Shine, even though first recorded by Frankie, turned out to be the big record by the Walker Brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had successes because there were just some things I guess we didn't think worked as well for us, you know, uh, like Silence is Golden. We mm -hmm. recorded it first, but I think it was a B-side. Uh, and the tremolos came along, fortunately, <laughs> and covered it, and it was great. And then came along the concept album, uh, The Genuine Imitation Life Gazette. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> which I still have nightmares about. I, you know, I had a, uh, it, I, I've always felt responsible for the, the successes and the failures. You know, uh, it, I've always put that burden on my shoulders. And, and when the Gazette album came along, it was a disaster from that standpoint. Uh, I still think it was one of the better things I've been involved with as a writer and a producer, but uh, it was a humongous flop by our standards. So that was a tough time, you know. Uh, I, no one's ever, uh, Frankie or anyone else, said that was the beginning of the slide, you know, mm -hmm. and it's your responsibility and you put us there, but uh, uh, I feel that way, I felt that way from that time. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of... Uh, plotted to find ways to, to reverse that years after but it was a tough time it was a tough time was that because of the Beatles Sgt. Pepper and uh, uh, Beach Boys Pet Sounds yeah I, I, I'm sure I mean they, I would, they were both brilliant albums and I was certainly influenced by them um, and so I, I I'm I I don't know, I, I guess influence is enough, you know. It, it, it put me in a place that I thought we should do more than just make pop records and mm -hmm. do an album. We never considered ourselves an album-oriented group. We would go in and make records and singles, and if they were good enough, they'd go in an album. But it wasn't concept or mm -hmm. uh, let, let's tackle this at, with a big, bigger picture in mind. So, yeah, in that respect... Uh, uh, I think we were the first ones. In fact, I know we were the first ones to do the uh, that concept with the cover and the artwork and the whole thing because uh, uh, Jeth Jethro uh, Tull Jeth came along yeah. with the uh, thick as a brick and pretty much emulated what we did. Mm. So I mean, you know, there was some sense of hey, you know, somebody got it. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I had dinner with John Lennon years after, and uh, it was interesting because. He was wonderful to, to just general conversation, you know, a real straight shooter guy. And he said after a couple of drinks, probably <laughs> why, but uh, he said, you know, that Genuine Imitation Live album you guys made, that was one of my favorite albums. I play it all the time. And You're I right. thought, well, well, I guess it was worth making. <laughs> yeah. Well, he sort of copied the cover, didn't he, when he did some yeah. time in New York City? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, it you know it, it wasn't a huge success by our standards, but uh, it was certainly a worthwhile project. What about then? Uh, not long after, you were in the studio working with Frank Sinatra. Yeah, Watertown, mm. another one of my failures. <laughs> uh, it, it, that was great. Mm. Uh, uh, it, working with Frank and spending time with him and uh, the stories and and uh, watching how people dealt with a, a living legend it, it, it was I felt like I was making a documentary mm. <laughs> you know I wish I was because uh, it would have been fantastic but he he again was uh, the, uh, the consummate professional in the studio he, he, he had a temperament no doubt uh, and uh, to get him to do more than one or two takes was a little difficult <laughs> <laughs> no less punching in and, and recording uh, uh, overdubbing it as opposed to live but it, it was a, a brilliant time for me, you know, I, I felt like I could do no wrong. Mm. And you had a long history with Neil Diamond. Yeah, we did, uh, I think, six albums mm -hmm. together. So obviously that was a successful relationship. That was a very successful relationship. Uh, and uh, we also did uh, You Don't Bring Me Flowers with Barbara and Neil, and that was a great time. Wow. Uh, that was uh, a moment, in, in, certainly in my life. So how do you control 
two legends like that. You've got Neil Diamond and Barbara Streisand in the studio, and you're the one producing it. It's interesting because, uh, uh, you know, you probably read a lot about Barbara. She, she, she will test people. Uh, she's pretty much able to do almost anything. So she can direct, she can produce, and she obviously sings like a Stradivarius. So, uh, yeah, she's tough. She's tough to deal with in that respect. Uh, and, I, and we had uh, maybe a minute and a half of, uh, of testing very early on uh, about what takes would be used. And she noticed I wasn't making any notes on take one, take two, what would be the better take, et cetera. And I just said, and she smiled, and that was the end of it. And from that point on, we were all in sync. Yeah, it's amazing the people that you have had the opportunity to work with, uh, and even though it was one song, Michael Jackson. Mm. Yeah, Michael was uh, a joy. He, he, it's a very sad time uh, for the for the music business, for the fans, for me, for anyone that's worked with Michael. And you know, paraphrasing what Quincy said, uh, Michael uh, w it was just a, a study in in what should be done and how music should be treated and. He uh, he had a total respect for the business, the people in it, the history, uh, the musicians. Uh, he he was uh, just a brilliant, brilliant, and unfortunately tragic uh, personality. I work with him. Uh, I believe he was fifteen or sixteen, so I, I didn't see a whole lot of what came after, you know. And he was just a joy, mm -hmm. just a joy to work with. How would you compare that life to the life of Elvis Presley then? Well, I, I, I suspect both of them had such a huge amount of pressure on them on a daily basis. Uh, I don't suspect I know. I met Presley in Vegas, um, and he was like an 8 by 10 glossy, you know, and he moved. He was just a stunning human being and very soft-spoken, uh, amazing singer, uh, amazing singer. Um, but, but at some point, uh, it, I... I I don't have to deal with that. I've never had to. You know, Frankie does, and the Presleys, and people, and Neil, and and it's it's got to be extremely difficult to be able to pull yourself out of that and get right back to the heart of what it's all about, and that's the music, whether you're writing or performing. So I I have a lot of compassion for Michael and and Presley, and and can understand any time that they would have made it a, a potential turn to the wrong side. Mm. It, it's so easy you know there's a line in our show you sell a hundred million records see how you handle it and that's so very true uh, there's so much pressure coming from every angle imaginable so to be able to still keep yourself together and deal with it and still make music I mean that's an incredible feat mm. let's talk about one of the more positive aspects of the, uh, mm. the career there one of one of the successes a lady called Judy coming into your life yeah. and, uh, and a couple more Four Seasons Hits, Who Loves You, and December 1963. Yeah, well, December 60 and uh, 1963 in particular <laughs> was uh, a moment in my life where I, I, I rarely have tackled lyrics on my own. Sherry, a few, you know, a few things, Big Man in Town, I think, and and so on, and I tackled that one on my own. And the, the uh, original lyric was December 1933 which was the pro, uh, re reappeal of Prohibition. Uh, and it really sucked. Mm. I mean, it was an embarrassing lyric. In fact, Rolling Stone printed a copy of it, <laughs> especially to embarrass me. Um, and, uh, you know, I went into the studio. We, we, we made the track. The band rehearsed it, uh, and it was a great track. It was just one of those joyous... <laughs> you, you could listen just to the track. It felt so good. And Frankie pulled me aside and said, I don't know, Bob, yeah, the lyric is, I don't know if we're going to get through this. I said, you mean it sucks? He said, well, yeah, yeah. He said, but, you know, the track's so good. It's a shame. I said, well, I mean, we're, we're, we have a couple more days left. I don't think this can be redone. So we'll just have to dump it. Uh, we have enough to cover. And he said, well, yeah, it's a shame. But anyway, that went off. And... Next morning, Judy had apparently stayed up most of the night, and 
she showed me this lyric and I said, bingo, <laughs> this is good. You know, I need to do this and I need to do that and change the bridge and so on and did some rewriting for the melody, but essentially the track and the chord structure was perfect. So, so we went into the studio and here we are. Wow. Yeah. Were you married at that point? No. So I did marry her. Yeah. The next day. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> No, it, it, and then Who Loves You, you know, we did did a whole album, so uh, uh, yeah, it's it, it was a whole um, comeback time, you know, we've had a lot of comebacks. But right at the point of the disco boom too, wasn't it, when those two songs hit? Yeah, you know something, I, we often get pegged uh, uh, as probably the Black Eyed Peas or some groups that, that do rhythmic records that are very danceable and probably get a huge amount of playing clubs. But I, I never intended for Who Loves You to be a disco record, uh, nor Oh What a Night. You know, and in fact, at the time, Oh What a Night probably wasn't even the right tempo. Mm. Uh, but somehow it's evolved into being club records, you know, uh, especially Oh What a Night uh, recently in different incarnations coming back and the French version of the rap thing with Yannick and so on. So. Um, I, I, I don't consider my probably Barry Gibb would say the same thing. Mm. You know, I don't think he sat down to make a disco record. Maybe, maybe a couple, but but there's a lot of things that they the Bee Gees have had played in clubs mm. big time, and uh, they were just good records. You know, mm. good rhythmic records. Mm. Well, it's great to uh, get you out here and hear the story of uh, Jersey Boys and the Four Seasons and. Wow, what a career you've had. Thank you. Yeah, you, Looking I, back at it, you know, would you, would you have changed anything? No, certainly not, not with the, the, the Jersey Boys now currently. And for me to watch that, there are nights where I'll watch the show and say, wow, that was a pretty exhausting career. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I do get exhausted. Yeah. Well, it must be great to be able to sit back and just watch your career. It is. With not, someone else doing it up there and, on stage. And not break a sweat. <laughs> it's the best. Bob Gordia, it's great to have you here.